Ladies and gentlemen, a very good afternoon to you and uh, thank you for being here for the session today. We have a very diverse looking audience. <laughs> I think looking at the list, uh, we have um, students, we have volunteers, we have those from academia, from business, from NGO, civil society. So uh, thank you very much and welcome to each of you uh, and especially my colleagues as well from Sunway University. Uh, my name is Mark Lee and I'm from the Jeffrey Chia Institute on Southeast Asia or we, as we call it here JCI at Sunway University and I have the great uh, privilege this afternoon of guiding you through today's session. Uh, my colleague at JCI, uh, Mr. James Chin, who is also director of the Asia Institute in Tasmania, some of you may know him, uh, he's unfortunately not able to be here with us but he sends his warm regards to all of us. And our first order of the day is to introduce uh, our distinguished speaker, Professor Alberto Gomez. Alberto is Professor Emeritus of Anthropology at La Trobe University in Melbourne and was director of the Centre for Dialogue at La Trobe as well. He's retired now and he's the founding di global director of the Dialogue, Emphatic Engagement and Peace Building Network, or better known as DEEP, a global community of peace workers researchers and policy makers committed to a sustainable and peaceful world. Before Alberto moved to uh, La Trobe some time ago in 1990, he was teaching at University Malaya. Alberto's main research interest is on the impact of state-sponsored development, capitalism and modernity on indigenous communities and particularly on Orang Asli. His public lecture today on the Orang Asli being materially poor but morally rich is indeed a counterintuitive perspective, I think for all of us, not just to contemplate but also to internalise. There is a lovely saying uh, that one sees clearly only with the heart and what is essential is invisible to the eye. So on that note, uh, we look forward to your sharing today. And so ladies and gentlemen, please invite me uh, uh, please join me to invite, sorry, Professor Alberto Gomez uh, for his talk. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mark, for this very generous introduction. And I uh, also would like to thank uh, Professor James Chin, who quite some time ago invited me to come and give a talk at the Jeffrey Chia Institute. And we've never been able to line up a, a time that was going to be suitable uh, for, for giving this talk. Now, if it's, if it's okay with you, I'd like to be a bit more informal, and the way I'm dressed is also quite informal. And, uh, being a director of a center at La Trobe University, I've, I've had to wear the suit on so many occasions that I've decided to keep it in the cupboard very safely and not ever use it again. But anyway, um, and what I'm also going to do is to tell you a few stories. Now, as an anthropologist, we are storytellers, and the stories that we tell, we tend to, you know, we, we tend to extract these stories from the experiences that we have had with the Malaysian Aboriginal people or with indigenous peoples, whoever that we study. Now, the first story I'm going to start with is that um, in 1981, you know, when I decided to go and, you know, research a particular group of people, and this was for my doctoral uh, research project. So I approached the Department of Aboriginal Affairs at Jabatan Arangasli, and they suggested a place for me to go. And, and then I went to this uh, place, and uh, I contacted the headman, spoke to him, and I said to him, look, I would like to come and live in this group for you know, uh, a year and a half. Now, this is tantamount to one of you going knocking at your neighbor's home and say, by the way, I'd like to come and live with you for a year and a half. Anyway. Um, I arranged for a number of uh, Orangasli to build me a house and I decided to live in this nice village on the way up to Cameron Highlands. Now I told the Orangasli at the time that I had come there to study the culture and I wanted to write something about the culture. Occasionally they'll come to me and they say, look, I'm going to tell you something, why don't you jot this down? You know, so that was their way of saying that you know, they've got something important to tell. Now one fine day, uh, night I should say, about two weeks after my stay in the village, uh, 
a group of Orangasi came up to me and they invited me out hunting. And we trapped in the forest, you know, hunting at night is quite, uh, quite a risk. Yeah? So we walked for a good part of an hour and we got into um, up a hill and we got to a point and they turned to me and asked whether I would like to rest. We sat at the crest of the hill and then one of them turned to me and said, uh, asked me, so what are you here for? And I decided to turn the question back to the, uh, the questioner and I said, so why do you think I'm here? And he said, well, I think you're here because uh, you are with the police and you've come to spy on us. And I asked, so do you think I'm with the police? And the person said, probably not. And then another person said, well, I think you are with the government and you've come here to try to persuade us to engage in some developmental project. And I asked, what about, do you think it's true? And he said, probably not. Then the third person said, I think you're with the communists <laughs> because you have come there to infiltrate and you're going to convert. I mean, not in those words, but you've come to convert us to communism. So I asked, is that the case? And then they said, no. Then I said, so what is it? Why do you think I've come to live with that? And which one of the three uh, is true? So they all looked at me and almost unanimously, they said, you know, we don't think so. And I asked why. And the answer was that because you don't look very smart. <laughs> <laughs> now, at that point, I felt quite good about that fact, you know. Primarily because, you know, if you get to know Orangasi, you know that uh, one of the things that Orangasi usually try to do is to conceal the true feelings. Because if they were to express the true feelings, especially to someone who they consider coming from dominant society, that they would face reprisals or be punished for the true feelings. So they, they tend to conceal those feelings of theirs. So in the case uh, of telling the truth, in that case, uh, in this particular story, the fact that they felt that I was not smart was an indication to me that I had finally you know, managed to get a build rapport with the people. They've accepted me. Now, reflecting on this story, many, you know, uh, 30 over years, I now come to think that they were right because I am actually not very smart. Because I come from a modern society, and I'm Western trained and Westernized, and I've not been smart in the ways that they have for generations, since time immemorial, you know, since the time that they have uh, been you know, subsisting on this land. So their kind of smartness is something that we have ignored. And so in today's talk, uh, I want to touch uh, briefly, because I am concerned about the time that I have at hand, and I'm just going to give you a few. Uh, uh, let's put it this way: I'm going to give you an appetizer, and the main dish is something that you probably can, uh, you know, you, you can probably uh, get it in due course. So, yes. Can I ask a question? Yes, you may. Uh, so you, have a you have to ask the chair. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe we can. There, no, that's one question. You didn't introduce, right? Do you have any Malaysian heritage or background? Or? <laughs> <laughs> I think good. that's fine. Okay, it's, it's, we, it's, it's a good question, and I'll answer it later. So, the two main groups of people that I have researched uh, are the people up in the north. They are referred to as Semang by anthropologists. Officially, they are referred to as Negritos, which, which is a which is an ethnonym that I object to because you know it has these racial connotations that are attached to it. And I prefer to call them Mandra, which is the word that they use to refer to themselves. It's an autonym. I first visited that community in 1975 as an undergraduate student. Now, the other group where I spent an uh, extended period of time are the Samai, and that's up around in the middle. Now, as you see, there are 18 ethno-linguistic groups uh, on the map itself, and there are, in, it is, in fact, a simplification of a much more complex linguistic uh, you know, distribution of, of the group's people. Now, the Simang 
Big Reach of Vanra, let's call that Vanra. Uh, they are hunter gathering people, uh, foragers. And in 1972, the Malaysian government uh, eventually, after a great deal of enticement, managed to settle them. And this word settled, which I put in inverted commas, uh, did I? No, no. Nomads. Because uh, the word settle here means that we take these people who are considered to be nomadic. And you know, being nomadic is uh, a difficult existence for not for the people, but for the state, because it means that they have difficulty controlling such groups of people. And settle them and introduce them to various aspects of modernity. So, you know, pattern, village, agricultural projects, and trying to convert them from hunting gathering people to sedentary uh, agriculturalists or cash croppers. So that was the, the program in 1972. But what this settlement also involved was freeing up the land that these foreigners may have used for use for other you know, purposes. So the Malaysian Aboriginal people who have moved, settled into much more localized places, that land has been then, you know, um, sort of opened up to logging land schemes uh, for Malay communities and various other, you know, purposes. When I first visited in 1975, this is how many of my, you know, um, Manrak friends lived in lean tubes and there was a an occasion where I travelled in the forest with them, living in, in such conditions. Now, in 1994, Economic development was not was considered to be important, but not uh, as you know as important or perhaps equally important. There was a conversion, uh, what one was referred to as spiritual development. So they were converted to Islam in 1994. And um, in my research, I'm just going to run through very quickly. This is one of the books that I published on the Munra, uh, and in this book it. It uh, analyzes the transformation, the changes in that community from 1975 right through to 2006, which was the last time I visited the community. In that project, I, uh, my focus was what is the impact of resettlement and all the associated changes uh, for the Munra. In 1978, this is how the community looked like, and then in uh, there was an introduction of a number of different sorts of projects. So you have you know, economic projects like uh, cash crops, rubber, and oil palm. Um, you have you know, educational projects like the schools that were established. And uh, at that time, you know, the Orangasti children were perhaps rightly so. You know, they were not so enthusiastic about going to the schools because the schools taught them uh, various things that were quite, in a sense, irrelevant to Oranasli in a life. And the only reason that they went to school was because the government or the Department of Aboriginal Affairs at that time uh, gave them you know, rice and taught them about you know, various kinds of things like uh, you know, mathematics and, you know, and you know, certain kinds of languages. Anyway, um, then we have uh, you know, a, one, a range of different kinds of projects. At one point, uh, some development planner felt that uh, you know, since these people were hunters and gatherers, let's you know, let's uh, convert them into uh, you know, introduce animal husbandry and let's get them to raise cattle. So uh, they were airlifted you know, cattle into the place, but you know, people don't drink milk and they do not know what to do with the cows. Now, um, I also showed you that slide there, which has uh, logging. You know, and in fact, one of my former students, uh, Peter, was with me when uh, living in the community at that time when we, uh, when we had uh, these logging trucks going in and out uh, several times a day. Now, this is some of the changes in the community. 1987, I showed you one slide early on in 1975, 1987, and in uh, 1997. Now, anyone who were to look at these houses in a way, okay, and this is where you know you would be uh, imbued with these kinds of thinking, that 
now they have been modernized. Okay, that they have lovely concrete homes. You know, they used to live in uh, very much in very <coughs> elementary sort of housing style. However, let's look at this idea of you know modernization, and let's look at this idea of what constitutes modernity. And uh, sometimes when we speak about it, we tend to focus a great deal on the infrastructure, on the various physical aspects of modernity. So, what was the impact of that development? Now, I'm going to uh, just show you one slide and summarize everything in that one slide of what, ha what has happened uh, during that period. So what we have is that uh, just basically we have uh, reduced access to resources and proper diets. Okay, you can uh, think how this would have happened. Secure in economic future because now as they have to depend on the market for the, you know, the price variations, the fluctuations of demand and supply for the various uh, cash crops that they produce. There was nutritional changes in the past they had a very balanced diet as hunters and gatherers, but now, uh, well, now at the time when I did my study in two, uh, from 1975 to 2006, the nutritional changes were quite drastic. They had to rely on market purchased food, which were, you know, invariably more expensive for them. And as a result, their diet was very poor, poor health conditions, they were crowded into very... Uh, you know, uh, small spaces, which led to, you know, which facilitated the various kinds of spread of diseases in those places, rising disease and mortality rates, and uh, an over-dependence on the market, state, and which in the, you know, which has res resulted in the loss of autonomy. So, for me to summarize this, I say that what this has caused is what I consider to be 10 words, which all begin with the letter D. So let me just run through very quickly. Dispossession, they have been robbed of their land. Displacement, they have been displaced from the land that they have been attached to, historically, socially, and ecologically. Their, their lands that they, their home land has been degraded through various activities like logging and the, uh, you know, the sort of pollution of the rivers. The destruction, not only of their land, not just the physical aspects, but the destruction of their you know, social lives. And I'll talk a bit more about some of this later. The increased dependency, which in the past they had, you know, autonom they were fairly autonomous. A rise of disease, and this is one aspect that I have written in my book, and I'll talk, talk about that in a minute. Discrimination. Even though they have been converted to, to Islam, there is still they're still considered to be primitive, backward. Often they are spoken in those ways. Deprivation. They've been deprived of a range of different things. And I'll talk to you in particular about the history and their social identity. Discontentment and dejection. Indigenous peoples right around the world, in any part of the world that you go to, and you, you, uh, you know, where I come from in Australia, you find that uh, the level of dejection, the level of discontentment is so high that there's a great deal of various kinds of abuses of, of you know, uh, alcohol abuse and you know, various other sorts of substances. So, in order to try to understand that, you know, I don't want to explain it, but I think it's important for us to try to understand it. In order to understand this, we have to actually look at the history of what such indigenous groups of people, whether it's in Malaysia or in any parts of the world, have had to undergo uh, at the hands of people who are more dominant and more powerful. So I want to just very briefly talk to you about one aspect of my research, which, were, which was to do with demographic change. So these are three population pyramids. I'm not going to bore you with the details of it, but very quickly, when you look at the three population pyramids, you can see that there is kind of difference, and especially the last one, right in the bottom, you have got a very broad base, which is an indication of a young population, and then it's quite a, kind of ragged around the sides. Now, in terms of figures, when looking at the fertility levels, 
In small populations, we tend to focus on two, which is the total maternity ratio and the maternity ratio. And when you look at the TMR and the MR, just looking at those figures, in 1978, 4.33, 1988, 5.33, and 5.57 in 1998. Anyone who was just to dwell on those figures would say, well, if they're having more children, then things must be quite good for them. Yes? So things must be fine. But when you look at the mortality figures, uh, this is for every woman that has reached the age of 45, to look at the number of children that have survived. So when you look at the life born, okay, you can see the increase in the figures. Here I've used, uh, I, I, I won't go into the details of the demographic techniques that I've used. But when you compare the life born and the surviving, you will see the number of children that have died when each woman has reached the age of 45 had increased from 0 0.67, 1.69 to 2.25. Okay, those are figures. In absolute terms, for every woman who would have had eight children by the time she reaches 45, she would have lost four. So for those of you who have got children, just put yourself in the shoes of such, you know, uh, you know, or I must be, you know, people who should be more important to us here in, in Malaysia, and ask the question, is this right? Okay. The other group of people that I researched was the Samai, and in this group, um, um, you know, they were forests, Dependence wilderness. Uh, they cleared parts of the forest and planted you know, crops that were useful to them as uh, subsistence farmers. And then uh, around the 19, I would say late 70s, 80s, they began to shift into cash cropping and you know various other activities. And they have been um, you know suppliers of rattan and, and bamboo for a very long time. So they've always been involved in the market economy or in, in the forest trading for a very long time. But in cash cropping, it's been relatively more recent. And for that, uh, I, you know, uh, just give you a brief. This is one of the books that I've published. And in fact, the publisher is seated right at the back there, uh, Colin Nicholas. Uh, so you might think that it's all my family and friends that have come for this talk. <laughs> <laughs> this is a Samai country uh, on the way up to Cameron Palace. I'll just show you a few slides. To, uh, and this is the village where I, I lived in for 14 months on the way up to Cameron Palace. And this is my little hut where I stayed for that period of time. Um, that's my hut at the very end, which had a good view of the whole village, and you know, uh, it, it was located in such a way that while I had a good view of the village, uh, the whole village had a good view of what I was up to. Uh, this is me in much younger days, and uh, you know, my field work, and uh, this is uh, me, you know, sharing food and with, with the people. Okay. Let me ask you, what are the things that you're worried about in this world that we live in? What are the concerns that you have about the future of our planet, the future of humanity? We have climate change, right? Let's talk about outside of Malaysia, yes? We have got climate change. Of course, Malaysia is affected by climate change, but I think there are other more pressing concerns that Malaysians have. What other problems? Fundamentalism. Fundamentalism, okay. Not just Islamic, I would say all kinds of fundamentalism. So when we look at, uh, you know, ecological crisis, not just climate change, but these are some of the ecological crises that we have. Now, we also have a crisis of increasing violence. So we have, uh, you know, when you go to places like Syria and Iraq and you know, all right around the world, we have pockets of places where, you know, people are living in such great deal of collective violence. Then we have social and humanitarian crisis. So these are the three main 
I would say, the triple crisis that uh, we are facing in humanity. So in the, in the social and humanitarian crisis, we have increased alienation. Okay, you go to different parts, especially in the West, you go to various places and you find that people are living alone, people are not, you know, uh, they have been estranged by their own societies, they have been uh, detached from their own, you know, families and friends. We have an increased marginalization and the group that I'm talking about, the Malaysian Aboriginal people, are a perfect case of that. Of that. Then we have increased racism and bigotry, uh, you know, whether we are talking about the US or we're talking about Australia or besides the, those two countries, any part of the world, we find that racism is uh, you know, showing its really ugly head. Then we have social injustice, okay, and we have refugees and asylum seekers, uh, you know, particularly in places like in Europe and also uh, in the Middle East. So when we look at all these um, social and humanitarian, humanitarian crises, the question that you might want to ask is, why is this happening? And I think what happens is that you tend to look at those in a very kind of compartmentalized way. You know, you tend to look at social and humanitarian, humanitarian crises and look at what could be some of those causes. The way I look at it, I have come up with what I consider to be the seven vices or the seven sins, if you are a religious person. The seven vices of humanity. And the first is uh, what I call ignorance. Now, often you say ignorance is bliss. Now, there's nothing blissful about ignorance because uh, the ones who keep saying that ignorance is bliss, they want you to live in this bliss because then you will not question the power that they have or the dominance that they have over you. So ignorance is not bliss, definitely not. Fear. Okay, we have the classic example in the US. Uh, the President of the United States has uh, this uncanny ability to instill fear. So in the US now, they fear Mexicans, they fear Muslims, and they fear mothers. So you know, you have, uh, you know, fear is a, is, a, is a big problem in the world that we have. The next voice I would consider to be hatred. Very quick, today, people are, you know, bound to say, I hate that person. And when you ask, have you ever met someone from that group? And say, no, but I hate that group. So, you know, there is such great deal of hatred in the world that we live in. We also live in a world where there is arrogance. We think that we are superior to everyone else. We think that we are superior as humans. Uh, in, in the world that we can do anything that we want in nature. And as uh, you know, Albert Einstein says that the only thing more dangerous than ignorance is arrogance. And I think the combination of the two is extremely dangerous. We have competition. In a neoliberal capitalist system, uh, it promotes, it fosters in a competition that we have to compete with one another to get ahead. And then we have, uh, to the extent that we think that competition is a natural part of human welfare, human you know, life. Then we have greed, which relates to competition. We are just not satisfied with what we have. Accumulative principle of capitalism, just keep on accumulating. Mass consumption, just keep on. You've got one television, it's not good enough. You have to have one in the kitchen and one in the bathroom. So you go on, you know, and you go on accumulating. And the greed is quite evident today. You know, you find that many of the multimillionaires, the billionaires, tend to be really greedy. I mean, we have lots of such examples in, in Australia. The final vice, the seventh one, I think for me, I think it's the most um, significant of all of them. In a sense that we are so apathetic. Apathy is great that it, it occurs at all different levels. For example, you'll say, I can't do anything about it, I'm just one person. Or you might perhaps say that, uh, you, know, um, what, you know, you can say that, oh, uh, you know, people dying in, in Syria uh, through all this bombing, but they're used to it, you know. 
Yeah. You say those kinds of things. And then you say, oh, you know, uh, so many people, one car bomb in Afghanistan. So many people died. Oh, this happens all the time. So, and we become so insensitive. We read the news, we watch this news, we watch such kinds of bloodshed while we're having our dinner, okay, on television. And it does not touch you. Now, the worst thing about apathy here is that you want to do nothing about anything. And this is where um, I'm hoping that in this talk that I want to invite you to, to do something about changing this world. In order to try to achieve that, what I would like to suggest is let's think about what the Orangasti can contribute. So, um, let's take the first of the seven vices and what we can do is try to transform them, convert them. We can uh, work on these vices to change it into what I consider to be the seven virtues of humanity. And in the seven virtues of humanity, from ignorance, we want to change it to, sorry, this is a bit slow, to knowledge and understanding. So I'm hoping that today I'll give you a bit, very little, but just a touch of the, the, the massive amount of knowledge that uh, Malaysian Aboriginal people are going us to have. And this is one of the ways that we can challenge the ignorance that we have. Fear into hope. And as the cultural Marxist, uh, Raymond Williams, said, to be truly radical is to make hope possible, rather than despair convincing. Because today, in this world that we live in, we have, in fact, made despair very convincing, to the extent that I think we need to you know, rebuild, revitalize, resuscitate hope as something that we should, you know, uh, hold on to very dearly. Then we have uh, hatred. We can change into, you, well, you know this, to love and compassion. And for this, I want to tell you another story from the Samar. I used to attend a lot of ritual ceremonies uh, when I was living with the Samar. And in these ritual ceremonies, which were called kubut, or they were held in the dark, and they were ceremonies that were held uh, as curing rituals uh, for a you know, sick child, and they believe that a child is sick because of soul loss and you know, the, the spirit has left the body and the shaman has to, through the assistance of a spirit familiar, retrieve the lost soul. So in one of these uh, ceremonies, uh, the shaman was singing the, you know, the spiritual song in order to, you know, get the, to invite the spirit familiar to come and take, you know, possess his body so that he can be used to cure the, the sick child. So when the, um, when the shaman was in the process of singing the special song, he, you know, looked down on me, I was seated in the hut. And as if like having a conversation with the shaman, he says to the spirit familiar, he looks not like one of us, but he has the same heart. Now this is perhaps one of the most profound statements that the Samai has made. Because we tend to focus on looks, on, on the physical aspects of it. So we tend to focus on how a person looks, the face, the... Uh, you know, the, the color of the skin, the color of the hair, and all these various kinds of, you know, the physical attributes of a person. But when we speak about the heart, it is a deeper connection that we do not see. And this is where I think the Samai, through the wisdom that they have, have focused their attention on something that's deeper, that connects all of us as humans. So that's one story and hopefully one lesson. So let's now begin to look at each other, not how 
we see in terms of our physical attributes, our phenotypical appearances. But let's look at each other in how we connect with one another. The basic connection is, of course, we're all humans. Samai would sometimes say that when you cut yourself, you, know, you get the same color of blood, red blood. So this is one of the ways of challenging this racial divisions that we have, the way we have been able to divide people. And this is certainly one of the ways of how we can build bridges to connect people by saying that all of us have the same heart, bringing people together. From arrogance to humility. And humility, I want to focus on two aspects of the Aranasli. One is to do with Aranasli interpersonal relations. And when you look at the Aranasli, when you just focus on that, we find that it is egalitarian, focus on equality, everyone in the community considers themselves to be equally important. People are humble, modest, non aggressive non-violence and uh, you know they, they believe they've got lots of kinds of spiritual beliefs that are connected to that that if you are you know hot so you're aggressive it is you know bad for one's uh, personality it is community focused rather than being you know strongly individualized and they believe in what they practice what is called a deliberative democracy and in deliberative democracy they believe that everyone has the equal right to uh, to make the decisions that are necessary within the community. So everyone has a voice, but the way they go about doing it is it is quite incredible. It's you know true consensus building, and, and the consensus building in the sense that everyone has the right to, to say something and to make <coughs> contribute towards the decision, and this is the true kind of democracy that we're talking about which is a democracy that happens in the village itself, among the Samai. They may have leaders, they may have Panghulus, but however, these leaders still are consultative and deliberative. Unfortunately, that has changed. Because what we have done, uh, we in a sense are talking of the, the government and the Malaysian uh, the authorities, is implanted a, a leadership system one that is based on hierarchical structures in the process you know, uh, you know, demolishing and, and destroying the kind of very uh, strong principles of egalitarian equality. And I think this is something that we can learn from the Malaysian Aboriginal people. And all this leads to them being peaceable. Okay? They are, you know, uh, you know, I learned a great deal from the Malaysian Aboriginal people. I was socialized in my schools to be very competitive, played a lot of sports, being violent, being aggressive, and definitely not being peaceful. And however, in the time I spent with the Malaysian Aboriginal, it had a tremendous impact on my personality and started to change those aspects of the aggressiveness into the peacefulness. But the other aspect of the humility is not the humbleness is not just to do with in the interpersonal relations, but it's more importantly, I would say it's also got to do with the way they think about nature. And they consider themselves to be part of nature. In our philosophy, well, I, I keep think, using these words, we and our, okay? I'm just making such an assumption. This is just a matter of speaking. But in the way we think about the world, we think that we have dominion over nature, that we can do whatever we want to the environment. And this you know, puts us above uh, nature, above the environment. Malaysian Aboriginal people do not think this way. In fact, some of my colleagues who have studied the Orangasli, one of my colleagues in particular, said for the Orangasli, the forest is like a parent and they are the children. So if you cut down the forest, it is tantamount to you committing patricide, killing your parents. So finally, or not finally, sorry, competition to cooperation. You know, when I, 
was living in the Malaysian Aboriginal community, uh, one of the, uh, among the Samai. I used to, you know, uh, play football with them. And, you know, growing up in Malaysia, I was, you know, a fairly you know, good football player. And I used to run circles around them because they were novices in uh, football. And what they used to do was that whenever I'd go past them, the ball, they would tackle me as if like, I was a rugby tackle and push me right down in the mud and they all stand around and laugh. <laughs> now, their idea of playing football was, uh, this was the early days, was not competitive, it was fun. So whenever we scored goals, the whole idea was that uh, let's try to then help the other team to score equal number of goals <laughs> so that we have an you know, uh, equal playing field. And so this was uh, you know, how they thought about competitive sports. Now the cooperation happens a great deal through the various activities that they perform, usually uh, in farming. I'm often you know, uh, t you know, taken to task when I give such a talk, because they say competition is natural. Uh, how can you say that uh, you know competition is unnatural? And you know, because we need competition uh, so that we can survive. We need competition so that we can get ahead in life. And often, uh, someone who subscribes to such a view would say that the reason uh, is because it's just natural through the process of natural selection. is a Darwinian principle. Survival of the fittest. Now, what they ignore in those arguments is that when Darwin wrote about the survival of the fittest, in his later publication, he said that the, 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 the fittest species are the ones that cooperate. So in fact, the ones that cooperate are likely to survive. And this is one of the problems that uh, another ecologist, uh, Paul Colin Wall, in his book entitled uh, Why Fierce Animals Are Rare, because basically they've competed and killed off each other. Now, Darwin wrote about the survival of the fittest, focusing on cooperation, but it was Peter Kokropin, a Russian um, you know, naturalist, who in fact has also published a book on evolution. And in his book, he went right across from St. Petersburg, right across Russia to Siberia, studied all the different species, and he found that um, the species that survived were the ones that had cooperated. So when we look at a natural world, we find a tall tree and we find uh, various creepers going up, you know, seemingly competing for sunlight. But they are actually all these different plants and the animals and all the various in insects, they are all cooperating with one another in this grand you know, scheme of nature. But humans, no. You know, we feel that we can go and convert whatever you know, nature is to suit our own needs and our own you know, uh, I would say demands. <coughs> so greed to generosity. There are quite a number of organizations right around the world that now focus on what we call um, this concept of giftivism. It's better to give than to take. And this particular uh, is from one of these organizations, which was set up by a person called Nippon Meta. And Nippon Meta is the person who started something called Karma Kitchen. Are you familiar with that? In Karma Kitchen, you don't pay for your own bill. You just go and pay ahead for the person who comes after you. So it's a, it's a system of giftivism. Now, in many parts of the world now, we have what we call solidarity economics, which is focused on gifts, giving, generosity, rather than the kind of capitalist system that we have, which is accumulation, and particularly in terms of surplus, surplus accumulation. Have a look at this uh, service space, and you'll see a very refreshing way of living your life, you know, where 
uh, these are communities that focus on cooperation, communities that focus on, on giving and generosity. Now, when I was doing my research, you know, when we think about give, we think about it in terms of what we call balanced reciprocity. So if I give you a Christmas present, you know, I expect you to give me a present at the time of my you know, festival. If I give you a birthday present, then you feel that, you know, uh, you would expect me, that a person, to give you a, a birthday present. And often you will say things like, oh, you know, it's, the, it's just the thought that matters, which is a load of rubbish, isn't it? Because you know that if anyone buys you a gift, you would expect that person to actually give you something that is of equivalent value. Because we think about gift through the eyes of what we call the commodity. Because you buy something, and you sell something, and you value the gift. The valuation of the gift occurs in the same way as you would value a commodity, which is something that can be bought and sold. Now this is the kind of reciprocity that we would refer to as a balanced reciprocity. I give you something, you give me something back. A gives B, B returns a gift to A. Now when I was living with the Samai, and this used to drive me absolutely mad, because one of the things that I wanted to do was to record all the exchanges that took place within the community. So hypothetically, on a typical day, a person from household A will go down to the shop, buy five fish, come up, keep one fish for that family, and give away the four fish to the other neighboring you know, households. Household B will go to the same shop, buy five fish, come up, keep one, give it to four. So at the end of the day, I had these maps of arrows showing fish going all across to the different households. And being an economic rationalist, I was going to say to them, why don't, you know, at the end of the day, they all ended up with five fish. So I said, why don't you just keep the five fish? Now, it was not the fish that mattered. It was the giving. And so the accumulation of the giving, the gifts, was what brought them closer. It was the cement, the, the concrete, I would say, that stabilized the community. And this kind of generosity, uh, reciprocity is what we call generalized reciprocity. A gives something to B, instead of B giving it to A, B gives it to C, C gives to D, and it goes on. When you have a large community, try this in your neighborhood. If you give something to your neighbor, your neighbor gives something else, Eventually, someone around the neighborhood will come and give you something okay, as a gift. And this, in fact, ties the whole neighborhood together. So this is one of the things that I learned from a Samai village, which I'm trying now to apply. I'm not in any way trying to convert people into Orangasli or to Samai, but what I'm saying is that these are certain kinds of practices, beliefs, philosophies that we can adopt in making the changes in our own lives. So, apathy to empathy. And empathy is, uh, in a sense, the ability to imagine, to put yourself in the shoes of another person, to identify with the pain and elation, the happiness of the person. Now, the reason that when you watch television and you see all these poor people in Syria dying and, uh, you know, and it does not sort of hit a nerve on you is because you have dehumanized them. But what you also have is that you feel a certain sense within yourself of sorrow that such people are suffering. And this is because as humans, and there is sufficient evidence to, to support this. As humans, we have something called a mirror neuron. The mirror neurons in our head, in fact, trigger you know, in the, in the certain kinds of connections with other people. So in other words, we are innately, we have the innate capacity to empathize. And we have, we in, in fact, are wired for empathy. So people that go out killing, are ones who are psychopaths because the mirror neurons have been blocked. Soldiers have to be trained in order to kill the enemy. First, they do this by dehumanizing the enemy. Secondly, they do this by blocking the empathy as much as they can. But in all the wars that have been fought, 
So just try as much as possible not to kill. So you find that because they, it's a constant struggle that they have between their, um, their mirror neurons, which is what they're wired for, and the instructions of the various commands that have been given them to kill. Now, this is perhaps one of the most important things. We suffer in this world with what I would consider to be an empathy deficit because we have de you know, we have blocked our mirror neurons in the sense that we do not any longer have that kind of connections with other humans. Malaysian Aboriginal people, the Samai story I told you about, we all have the same heart. In fact, that heart, if you want, can be con translated as the mirror neurons that in fact connects uh, people to one another. Now, finally, I want to touch on ecology. We have an ecological problem, no doubt about this, in the world that we face. And we find that, uh, you know, various parts of the world, we have various organizations, uh, the multilateral agencies of the United Nations, we have something called Sustainable Development Goals, and the focus is on what we call sustainable development. I have real problems with the word sustainable, and I have bigger problems with the word development. Because when we put them together, it's an oxymoron. Because we cannot, in fact, continue the economic growth, the very uh, senseless economic growth that we have at the moment, we are obsessed with such kinds of e you know, economic, kind of economics, or such kind of, I would say, obsessed with economic growth, to an extent that we cannot sustain that. But in order to give us the illusion that we are actually uh, you know, concerned about the environment, we have come up with this concept called sustainable development. Now today I would prefer to use the word regeneration because regeneration is natural. In nature, nature regenerates itself. The forest is, is uh, naturally destroyed through a uh, lightning storm or through a fire and it regenerates. Okay, humans, in fact, we regenerate. Okay, we do not just sustain. And so I think it's really important for us to start thinking differently about that. Sustainable development tends to be anthropocentric in the sense that it is humans that are important because we want to continue sustaining our economic lifestyles at the same time giving lip service to being caring for the environment. But when we talk about uh, being ecocentric, the focus is on regeneration so that we are ensure not just recycling but we ensure that whatever we do, we do not in any way hamper the ability of those systems to regenerate. Just a couple of examples. I know I've used up quite a bit of time. Am I okay? Yeah. Yeah. yeah? Now just a few more minutes. No, please go ahead. So just quick two examples from the Malaysian Aboriginal people. When you want to plant a plot in the forest, they go to the plots and they seek the permission of in Sama is Yani Kalu, they seek the permission of the ground dwelling spirit. So humans do not own land. Okay? I know this is really problematic because uh, such an argument can fall into the hands of you know authorities who say, yes, of course Orangasi don't own land, let's go and just grab it from them. But that's a different system. But I'm talking about as humanity itself. In the philosophy of the Malaysian Aboriginal people, like the Samai, even if you want to use, you know, um, if you want to go and urinate in a certain part of the forest and seek the permission of the ground dwelling spirit. So in other words, you know, the earth is the deity itself, uh, expressed through the yeah, spiritual system. Now, in many of the dominant religions, the focus is on uh, what we call the sky focus. Uh, these are sky focused religions. The gods are the divinities out there somewhere away from the earth. But indigenous peoples, almost invariably, their gods, their deities are earth based. So the simple logic about this 
is that if your deity is earth based, then there is less likelihood if you're a spiritual religious person, there is a, an almost absent, um, I wouldn't say less likelihood, it's, it's almost totally unacceptable for them to make any changes to the land because that would mean, you know, that would mean aggravating, you know, the spiritual connection that they have to the land. So when they speak, when indigenous speak, indigenous people speak about, we have a spiritual connection to the land. This is one of the things that they're talking about, that it's to do with worshipping the land. And I mean, environmentalists have sometimes misunderstood this. So they think that if they go and hug trees, that this gives us gives them the spiritual connection to the tree. But however, it's much deeper than that. So this is what I call deep ecology, okay, which is con which I would want to contrast with shallow ecology, which is like sustainable development. Let's go and try to, you know, cut carbon emissions and become carbon tax. That's pretty much shallow ecology. But in order to to develop in order to formulate, in order to kind of cultivate a deeper connection, we have to think differently about the way we relate to the environment. So every time you kill something, you think twice about it. Okay? Some I kill, yes, of course. They go out hunting, they kill. The difference is this. We go to the supermarket and we buy pork or beef or whatever meat that you, chicken or whatever meat. It's all clean wrapped, it's all packed nicely in the supermarket. You take it home, it tends to detach you from the violence that you're committing when you are eating that piece of meat. Because it makes it, you know, acceptable. And it detaches yourself from the animal. When a Samai uh, in the forest shoots a wild pig, one of the things they try to do is they run to the wild pig as quickly as they can before the, the pig loses, you know, before the pig dies grabs hold of the snout and apologizes. So although they have killed the pig and they apologize saying that I'm sorry to take your life because I have to feed my family. Although they have gone ahead and committed this act of violence, but there's a recognition of the violence that they've committed. Now the last point I want to make about the environment, uh, uh, ecology and deep ecology in particular, it's to do with uh, the way we think about our history. So, when we talk about history, we have what we call a temporal consciousness of history. We think in terms of time. 1957, Madeka. Okay, so that's the time. Now, when I was uh, interested in Samai history, I would ask them uh, about events of the past and ask them questions. So when did this happen? When did it happen? And they would just shrug their shoulders and they said, well, you know, I do not know. And they would just say, Nama, long time ago. So how long ago? How old were you? I kept asking questions of that sort because I was interested in time. That's the way I was taught history. It was all about dates and events associated with dates. Then one fine day, I was walking in the forest and they said to me, well, do you know that story I told you about how the people came up the stream and took us as slaves? This is where they sharpened their knives on the rock. And then I realized that a walk in the forest with them was a journey into their past. Because each point in the forest, each part, each land aspect of the landscape, each brook, each river, each tree, each uh, rock, and a historical significance. So, if your history, your social identity, was so intimately tied, connected to the land, then if you were to change it, it means that you're changing, not just the memory, but the visible, concrete connections that you have with your history. So clearing a forest will be very much tantamount to going and wiping out a museum or going to the British archives and destroying the whole archive because you know that's the way we think about our history. 
The conversion in our way of thinking about history from a temporalized consciousness to a spatialized consciousness has deeper implications for the way we think about the environment. So, if I were to describe today's talk, I would be less to say that this is you know, 14 July 2017, but I would say it's lecture theater, room seven, whatever, the space. So the space where you are, then is bigger, is histor historicized, is given a social meaning, a name, and that space then becomes a place, which becomes meaningful to you. So land has historical significance, a landscape is where space is converted into place, sacred connections with the ancestors and ecology, where people are buried, where people have died, where people were born. And this is, a, is in fact an amalgamation of nature, the supernatural in terms of history, the ontology, which, which means our self, our being. Ontology is the sort of knowledge and the study of the self and the history, bringing all these together to what we consider to be the kind of connection that we have with nature and our histories. Now, when you ask uh, indigenous peoples, how do you know this? You ask the Samai, so how do you know this that you just told me? And the answer is that because I'm Samai. So it's just almost like ridiculous for you, you know, uh, I ask one of you, how do you know this? Because I'm, you know, I'm up, <laughs> you know, and it, it tends to be very ridiculous because we extract our knowledge, our information from the books that we, we read or from the information that's imparted on us through the various educational systems that we have. But for them, what we call, you know, this, the understanding of knowledge or the, the study of knowledge is that in in academic speak is epistemology. So in our epistemology, we detach the knowledge from the self, from the various people. But for them, they combine the ontology, which is their people or their self, with their epistemology. So indigenous peoples speak of something that's called ontoepistemology. So it's a combination of these two. Now, just uh, uh, for those of you who are you know, studying philosophy, you know that in you know the Descartes and the Cartesian philosophy, you divide everything, the dualism. So you've got male, female, and then you've got the mind and the body. Now, in many of the kind of more refreshing indigenous philosophies, this is there is no separation. There's no dualism between those two. It is a combination. So when you say that I know this because I learned it by heart, it means it's a combination of the mind and what is there pumping in your body, which is the heart. And learning by heart is, do you remember those of you in school, your teacher will say to you, read this well, I want you to learn by heart. In other words, to learn it deeply. So, my conclusion is this. I mean, I've got lots more to say, as you can imagine. Is that instead of teaching indigenous peoples like Orangasli, I think it's about time that we must make them our teachers. And, uh, and this is in particular if we want to solve all the various global problems we have. The climate change, and I've just given you a snippet of some of these ways of how, you know, the Orangasli ways of life and their philosophies and their conceptions and their, and their histories can be connected. And, you know, uh, to you know, solving some of the problems that we have in the world today. And I want to stress this, that there's much that we can learn uh, from the way they relate with their fellow humans and with the environment, and nature in particular. And for them, their relations are grounded. Okay, so they're grounded in the sense they're earth-based religions, they're grounded in respect, in respect for one another, in love, in compassion, caring, empathy, and this, if we ground such relations, we'll be able to nurture what indigenous peoples in South America refer to, to this concept of Boing Vive, which is Spanish for the good life or good living. So the Boing Vive can mean different things to different people. But the problem that we have in our world today is our 
idea of the good life, okay, tends to very much be contradictory to the idea of what nature would want us to, to, to have as an aspect of what would be good, not only for humans, but good for the planet and good for each other. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Alberto. Uh, so much profoundness uh, in, in your sharing today. Uh, and I'm sure many of us uh, also, while digesting and uh, trying to internalize that, have our own questions. Um, this is a time, a good time to, to raise them uh, for Q&A over the next... Uh, we still have a, a good uh, 45 minutes or so. so um, I encourage you, uh, please uh, re uh, ask questions, post your questions to Alberto. We, as you can see, we are a very small group, so please feel free and comfortable. Uh, you could identify yourself, and uh, yeah, our staff will go around to pass you the mic. Thank you. Uh, Alberto, my name is John, KJ John. Of course I know you. <laughs> uh, there is no text without context. That's an absolute statement. Uh, it's important to me, having heard all that you have shared, to understand what's your heritage. <laughs> it's important that I know whether you did start off in Malaysia and then move to Australia and come back to share knowledge. Because uh, otherwise it's text out of context. First point. Second point is, uh, I used to have a professor called Said Hussein Nas. He wrote the thesis, Man and Nature, The Spiritual Crisis of Modern Man. I don't know if you're familiar with the work, and if so, how does it correlate to much of what you've uh, expressed today? Thank you very much. Thank you for that question. And I think, uh, the, as, as you know me, that uh, I was born in Malaysia, and I've lived in, in Australia now for half of my life. But the, the point I'm trying to make here is that we tend to focus so much on our nationality. We tend to fo focus so much on our ethnicity. And as you know, you know, in one of the public lectures that I gave uh, at your university before, I pointed out that in Malaysia, um, Malaysia is described as a country of you know, multi-ethnic people, a multi-ethnic country, a multicultural country. And then the next sentence is the country is divided into Malays, Chinese, Indians, right. and others. And one of the things I suggested is how about Malaysia defining itself, describing itself differently, that it is a country of multi-ethnic people, so that each person is already part Malay, part Indian, part Chinese, or, you know, Kadasan or Jusuf. Because I think it's really important to, uh, to try to escape from these, what uh, Ahmadiyya Sen has referred to as singular identity. So in, in my case, although I was born in Malaysia, um, and I live in Australia, I'm an you know, Australian citizen at the moment. But it does not really matter, largely because I think like, uh, one of the things that I learned from the Orang Asli, they call themselves human. So Mandra means human. Uh, Semai call themselves an Or, which means human. So this is, uh, this is one of the things that uh, matters a great deal. So for me, you know, I have to carry a passport when I want to go across borders and boundaries at least have all been established to divide people. So I think it's about, well, I don't think anyone, any of us have the power to, to break those borders that have been created or those boundaries. And today we find that even in, in some parts of the world, in the US, they still want to build walls where what we need to do is build bridges. So. Thank you for the question, but yeah. you comment on I, I don't have much to comment on that, but yeah. Um, and I think uh, my, if I can say that my view, I mean, I don't want to be critical of any uh, religion, and I make it very clear that, that I don't want to do that. Uh, but as, as a matter of uh, trying as much as possible to be objective. I think we have to look at it analytically and see that all those uh, you know, religions that are earth-based religions, 
there is a strong, um, I would say, a, a strong possibility for those people to have much greater respect. Um, I always remember a study that was conducted in the 1960s uh, by an anthropologist called Peter Constater in Thailand, uh, among the Lua. He explained the environmental degradation that was taking place in that part of Thailand. Um, he, in fact, connected that to the conversion of the people to Christianity. Because it says that when they were, um, you know, when they had, you know, their, you know, when they were believers of their, their traditional religions, they believed that uh, there was the Lord of the land that had, they had to seek the permission. And if you, you do not protect the land or you do not treat the land in the way that the Lord would expect you to, and this is the deity that's from the land, then you're going to be punished by poor harvest, you're going to be punished by sickness. So that's the way they relate to the land, yeah? that spiritual connection which is combined. When they were converted to Christianity, the Lord of the land was gone. Yeah? So people went in and they just, yeah, and they, they over-cultivated areas, they destroyed, degraded the land to a great extent. Um, to where my heritage is, um, you know, from uh, originally my parents are from Goa in India. And the concept of the devil among the Goans uh, in Konkani is Diosa, which is because when the Christians converted the Goans, they did not have a concept of the devil. So they took the, the indigenous deity, which was a deity, the Diosa was the the deity of the land, and told the, the Hindus that were reconverted that if you worship uh, Diosa, then you're worshiping the devil. All right. So this is where, uh, uh, so I'm not being critical of Christianity, don't get me wrong, I think it's fine. Uh, so, I mean, it's fine for you to believe in whatever religion you, 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 know, you believe in. But the point I'm trying to make is, from from a perspective, uh, I would say, you know, uh, from from hiding behind this piece of timber here, that I can say that, you know, objectively, there is a distinction between the Abrahamic religions and the sky focus, where the divinity is abstract, and from where the divinity is real, it's there in nature and. The spiritual uh, you know, reference is, in fact, uh, almost like an icon for what the nature is. Referring to your conclusions, I have a bit of concern that uh, there's a lovely saying that if somebody really fell in sleep, you can wake him up. But if somebody pretend to sleep, it's very hard to wake him up. So it seems like, yes, we are in a time that we shall make the indigenous people teach us. I guess we know the fact, we know that what is harming us, I mean, uh, why we are having this struggle of environment and all this. Uh, but because of this uh, unlimited want and limited resources, we still, uh, what do you call, became a fan of this capitalist sort of society. So how could we, uh, I mean, uh, make some strategies or we come up with some strategies that we can wake these people up who are pretending to sleep? Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Well, that's part of the reason I'm standing here talking to you because I believe very strongly that uh, if we continue to dialogue, conversation, we, we talk to one another about this, that we are, in many ways, you know, all we have is a small hammer and we're chiseling away on this massive wall that has been constructed over a number of years. Um, it's quite, I would say, hopeful and rather... I'm rather optimistic. In the last few years, we find that uh, in, in many parts of the West, there, there are positive changes that are taking place. Okay? Uh, to the extent that uh, in, you know, I go to Spain once a year to, to teach. And in Spain, I, over the last uh, 10 years that I've gone to this particular place, I could see the changes in a way that uh, people are responding to various kinds of 
you know, ecological changes. And sometimes, you know, the, the reason that the Spanish have been changing is largely because of the, what they call the economic crisis in Spain. And the crisis has actually forced them to, to make those changes in terms of, you know, solidarity economics. And also the rise of various kinds of movements and political parties. And for them is one example. But you also have uh, a, a large number of movements, like the degrowth movements of, of economists who are thinking differently. For them, you know, economic growth is no longer important. Uh, in fact, the degrowth, the focus is not on quantity, but on quality. So instead of having economic growth rates, which uh, through indices that indicate, you know, so yes, uh, you know there are people sleeping, but uh, uh, you know, to use your analogy, I think the the thing too is that uh, you know many people around around the world are now awakening, and the movements are important. And even if we have a number of elites who are basically greedy, uh, we just need to work through you know the mobilizing. Uh, more and more people trying to educate them, trying to sensitize them to the various kinds, you know, making them more conscious of the various problems that we have to know. And what I'm trying to do with my talks is to focus on, uh, on, on some little changes that we can make in terms of you know, ideas to do with generosity, generalized reciprocity, ideas to do with non-violence and, and non-killing and, you know, uh, being less aggressive, so perhaps now when you leave this room, you you know if someone honks at you, you know for moving, just smile, just smile at the person. No need to engage in road road rage, you know, because that would be like a surmise stuff. And this is one of the reasons uh, I left. Um, you know, I decided to opt for early retirement from my. Uh, professor's position at the Trope University because I wanted to, whatever the years that I have left, I wanted to engage in activism. So we set up the Deep Network, which uh, which has now 300 members in 18 different countries. And they're all very young um, activists that are you know, making a difference in the world, educating. So, have you, in the context of your own Asli, have you seen any? sort of examples where, uh, not the term integrated into society, but where they have been genuinely treated as, uh, as equals, um, but equals not in the sense of our understanding, in the sense that people, governments or society has woken up to see uh, the beautiful heritage and values that they have and, um, and sort of embrace them and, and, just, and just live together. You have seen many different um, Areas in, in, in your work across the world. So, has there been anything that, that stuck mm -hmm. you that perhaps Malaysia can can begin to grasp and mm -hmm. and take a little bit forward? Thanks. Yeah. Thank you. I think uh, I mean there are changes, but not enough uh, because generally you find that um, you know people still have a very negative image of the Orangnya sleep. Um, I still get people coming up to me and saying, um, sometimes you know, someone will come up to me and say, oh, you work on the Aurang um, You know, I want to go there because they have an agenda. They want to go there to carry out missionary work. And they say, no, actually, I want to help them. And my answer to such uh, statements is that I think you need help. <laughs> you know, and the way that we can do this is actually by going in there treating them with respect, and learning from them. And the more important thing to consider too is that this exchange must always be, uh, you know, true mutual respect mm -hmm. for one another. And I don't think that's ever, that's, mm -hmm. um, and in fact, if I can say, I mean, I'm sure uh, Colin Nicholas has got more to say about this. And, you know, we have several, uh, you know, Orang Asli in, in room here and I'm sure you know you can ask them. So in any case uh, I, I teach across the road in Monash University Malaysia, Japanese Chia School of Medicine yeah. and, and I came into working with rather than on 
Because when you say on, what are they? They are humans just like yeah. us. And I think that that whole thing should be debunked. You're not working on them. We are working with them. Um, whether it's research or through, you know, education um, initiatives or even services and outreach and that sort of thing. So I really liked the way you actually seamlessly wove your narrative from introducing the people and the communities to the philosophies and how we can actually look at perhaps building a better world and a more aware world of differences and, and, and the environmental issues. Um, just, just to give you a background, I started working with them only in 2003-2004, coming from a genetics, migration and evolutionary angle. And because I've been working in the faculties of medicine, we also have a medical link yeah. to Orang Asli Health. And what you say is true because we have noticed a, a great transition uh, in this country from the initial work done by Adela Baer, I think you may know yeah. Adela Baer. Mm -hmm. She's yes. still in Oregon, yes. um, I believe, mm -hmm. and, and she's done some early work. So, so what I would like uh, to ask you and, um, is whether or not um, you see a, I mean, a way forward in terms of education because that's what I think will be bring people forward in a sense of mainstream education because that's what our schools are set up for, that's what education is around the world. Do you see a need or is the deep network working towards some, um, you know, approaches where the education can, we can sort of, you know, make them a little bit more or reach out to them in terms of educational opportunities. And I do see a researcher here from UKM that is actually, I met probably last weekend, that is looking at halfway homes or halfway houses to actually acclimatize some of these children to mainstream education. Do you think that is one way to go? Or, or whatever thoughts do you have, maybe you can share with us as to how we approach this um, in terms of education and empowering the Orang Asli? I think it's really uh, important to ask the question, what sort of education that is being uh, promoted to such groups of people? Indeed, we have one project that's called the Thought Box Education. And the person who is running the project is based in England, and she is an ex-teacher. And in her she produces a lot of educational curri curriculum material, but the focus uh, is not about learning, but it's about unlearning. Mm -hmm. Because what we have is that kids learn a great deal, but a lot of what they learn uh, tend to be, uh, you know, tend to be sort of material that or information that they gain from, say, listening to the news, the television. They learn about uh, being bigots, I would say, from uh, you know other bigots that are being presented. So they learn about being aggressive from listening to President Trump. So those are the kinds of things that they are learning certain kinds of personality traits that uh, we would consider to be far more damaging. So, yes, precisely. So when they go to school, uh, you know, when I I wrote this. Uh, book, one of the things I did was to look at the schooling system within the uh, community and I found that the material that was covered was essentially what it had done was to reinforce the place of the Orang Asli as being you know, people who were way down. So this was an educational system that made them uh, learn the packing order in the country. So they were always you know, considered to the uh, to the extent that they start to apologize. They, they ask them, so you know, why don't you learn this? And they say, what do you expect? You know, like he the orang asli. So there's always that kind of almost like a self-fulfilling prophecy mm -hmm. of incorpor you know, in incorporating all these kinds of various prejudices that are not just you know they're embedded <coughs> prejudices and discrimination and school kids that go to schools they, they, they still continue to get discriminated okay, and I mean uh, as I said you know uh, Colin would be able to do 
you know, working in, in an organized NGO who is very much at the, the cold face of what's, what's happening in those communities. And when I talked to, you know, some, last weekend I was with one of my organized friends, and you find that uh, all those communities that I visited uh, in the 1980s, uh, there are visible changes in the community. <coughs> But however, the social conditions have not changed as much. So I think, um, yes, education would certainly be a way, but uh, you know, I think once uh, Orangasi have been educated, sometimes what also happens is that they are educated out of their Orangasi community. So then they become, you know, someone else and living in in a suburb in KL, and, you know, being detached from the community. So I don't really have the answer, but Colin, actually, uh, on education, in the, in the whatever document that we have today, there is the number of recommendations which have been uh, put forward on page. Whatever it is, something down there. No? It's, it's very very good. But the, but the issue is uh, the issue is the kind of education the Orang are being exposed to. And the kind of education that is traditionally they're used to is totally very different. Mm. Because an Oranski child doesn't learn from the teacher, the Malinois teacher or the English teacher. He learns from the parents, the grandparents, the children, the other children, mm. the cousins and so on. They are the teachers. So the various, the various knowledge to be learned from various peoples. So the whole village, the whole, whole community, uh, you know, the source of their learning. But when it comes to the school system, well, they, they want education, don't get me wrong. You know? They need to know how to read and write. They need to know how to count so they don't get cheated and they know how to do the rights. The issue is uh, what is being taught to them, how it's being taught to them. And, uh, and it's not a case of the honestly rejecting education or the parents have a poor attitude. That's what always the governments always say that uh, the profile rate is very high because the poor attitude of the parents towards education. That's not. Or an Ashley child wakes up at 4 o'clock, 4.30 in the morning to get to get to school because the bus or the, the truck that comes can only come at that time because they make a few trips. And sometimes when it, does, it rains or the, the guy who owns the truck, um, you know, he breaks it down and he cannot, cannot repair it, he has a problem. The kids don't go to school for a few days. They go back behind. So there are many, many issues. The, the, the main issue is that the Orang Asli are treated as subjects. You know? You are working for the Orang Asli, you are doing this for the Orang Asli. Many people will tell you that if you work in the department of Orang Asli or whatever, you will go to heaven because you are doing such welfare work. The Orang Asli do not want welfare, they want justice, that's all. And to be part of the whole process. Apart from education, what are other ways that we can take to create awareness on this? You mentioned the seven virtues that we can learn from the Orang Asli communities. So, I mean, we also learn this in like in school, in religious teachings and so forth. So how do we solidify this fact that, yes, we can learn this, but from the Orang Asli community? If you are from the media, the press, I think one of the ways that you can probably do this is by highlighting um, the, the few things that so far you know, Colin and I have said. And rather than, I think what happens too is if I can be a bit critical of the media as well, um, the, the media tends to focus a great deal on what we call the kind of <laughs> the exotic, <laughs> sensationalized you know, aspects of Orang Asli life. So if you can go and perhaps uh, you know highlight some of these kinds of uh, sort of lessons, and, and these are you know I would say the Orang Asli wisdom, and if you can start to work through these various. Uh, I mean, I've only given you a bit about the Orang Asli um, sort of lessons that one can gain. You, know. you can, you know, interview several of the Orang Asli. Uh, I'm not suggesting interview people like me. I'm a researcher. I'm suggesting that you go interview, you know, Orang Asli themselves. And the, the risk about that is that when you go as an outsider, uh, asking you know, Orang Asli, what is it that I can learn from you? Then they have, for such a long time, been, in a sense, uh, dominated to the extent that even when I went to live with Orang Asli and I said, I want to learn about their culture, and they looked at me totally baffled. Because they said that, 
We want to learn from you. Because what, what can you, you know, what can we contribute to the understanding? So I think it's really important as an anthropologist. What I've done is, in a way, decipher some of the, you know, some of the various stories that they've told and then seek the importance of the significance of those stories to connect with what, you know, what our own lives are. So ultimately, the, the role of an anthropologist is you know, to translate. So this is my interpretation of the culture. But I think you can, you can play an extremely important role with being in the media because what you do is essentially take the statements that a lot of people have made, but you have the ability to then, uh, the capability, I should say, to then, um, you know, to reach out to a much larger, larger, larger audience. So yes, of course. Uh, and in the short period of time now, I can't tell you, you know, Maybe some of the things that we have said, and perhaps later there are several RNRs you can ask me. Thank you for that question. I think you play an extremely important role, not only in creating an awareness of what we can learn from the RNRs, but also highlighting the plight that the RNRs are experiencing. Because I think if you start to, to you know, you, you start to investigate a bit more about this, and you will see that. Uh, you know, what they are experiencing uh, is, is incredible. Um, you know, it's, it's so deplorable. Hey, we, we take, this can be quite controversial. I'm not allowed to make controversial statements. <laughs> <laughs> Last weekend, uh, I was talking to an Orangasti, and they said that uh, JACO, which is the department that is supposed to take care of the Orangasti welfare, um, more than 90% are non orangasti mm -hmm. Okay. Now, I'm not suggesting that you should have, uh, you know, that all orangasti is going to make matters better. But this is to do with the, the, the question of self-determination. If you can't even get the own, and I'm not just saying Malaysia is, is, the country, is the only country of all that practices this. Australia is, you know, yeah. incredibly backward in terms, although it is much, Australian Aboriginal people have got a much stronger voice in, in the country, uh, even to the extent that recently the Australian government offered them a, you know, a prop, uh, the possibility of a referendum to acknowledge the, Oregon, uh, the Australian Aboriginal people in the Australian constitution. And they rejected that because they said that they only want treaty. So this is the, you know, the boldness of the uh, riches which is a good one, and a lot of us have been very supportive of that. I have a question that the Malaysian government is taking various economic development programs for Oranasli, and you have also mentioned some, and they are taking the forest and land away and putting them in a new land, all in the name of increasing the well-being or welfare of these people. In your opinion, how successful the government is, because it's been happening for the last few decades. The, the, the short answer is they have been very successful in uh, you know, creating all the problems uh, as far as our own is concerned. But uh, as far as, as, as I mentioned, you know, I had to cut short my talk quite a lot. I mean, I, you know, you know, we're talking of about 30 years of work and we're just trying to collapse it into one slide. And that's why I came up with those 10 Ds. And this, uh, unfortunately, this is, this is very much the case. If you are interested, there are several books that have been published uh, on this topic. Uh, in, uh, there are several of us. Uh, Colin has published a book. I've you know, published uh, a couple of books on this topic of the impact and development. So there's, there's quite a lot of material on this, uh, on this topic, on this subject. <coughs> and you know, I'll be happy if you email me. I'm happy to give you some references. Hi, good afternoon. Um, I'm Zara from the Beauty of Malaysia. Um, I was really interested in your um, preference for the word regeneration over sustainable development, um, which I, you know, being from the I can very much understand 
uh, regards to the environment. But I was just wondering, how do you how do you apply that to human well-being? So when we when we talk about regeneration uh, as a concept, it's not just to do with um, it's not just to do with the way we connect with the environment, but regeneration also to do with the way we um, we rebuild our communities. So one of the approaches that I use is something called peace ecology. I do not see peace and ecology as two separate, um, you know, two separate sort of concerns, um, whether it's to do with research or to do with, with activism. But I see peace ecology as uh, really a malgration. We can only deal with the question of the ecological problems or ecological degradation if we can build peace. Now, the, the whole idea of peace ecology here is to do, with, to do with regeneration. So if we can solve the problem of alienation, for example, we solve the problem of inequality, if we solve the problem of gender inequality in particular, if we solve the, pro uh, solve, solve, sorry, the problem of um, injustice, we solve the problem of discrimination, all these different kinds of problems that tend to break down communities, then there is a much stronger chance of people living, you know, not just peace with one another, but living in peace with their environment. The collective violence that we see around the world, which has led to a great deal of destruction, uh, is to do with the fact that our communities have been broken down to the extent that uh, you know people do not see any hope in terms of rebuilding or regenerating communities. So I'm using regeneration not just in the focus of the environment, but in, in, ten, in terms of the regeneration of trying to solve the various kinds of problems we have uh, within, uh, within communities and within societies. So take displacement. The, the number of people who are internally displaced is absolutely staggering right around the world. So if we can... Uh, when we have such a high number of internally displaced people, so what chance is there for them to do the right thing as far as the environment is concerned? So, you know, it's a regeneration in those terms. But um, there, there are several uh, writers now focusing on this concept of regeneration. Uh, if you uh, if you look up the, the Guardian, there was a very good feature article in a few years, uh, a few years ago, which uh, focused on the use of regeneration rather the concept of regeneration rather than sustainable. But well, I'd be happy to talk to you more about it. Okay, I'm Sumati. I'm from University of Technology Petronas, SEPRA. For the past 10 years, I've been working with the Saman. Uh, focusing on issues on literacy and education. And I would like to add to Colin. Um, I think mainstream actually alienates um, orang asli children and um, we have a curriculum as if one size fits all but we have to understand that it fits none, okay? Uh, but the question that I have for um, Prof is based on your experience, um, you know, if you were to write on, uh, critically on issues uh, on, um, about the orang asli the challenges and differences between um, being an academic, you were once an academic in Malaysia, and now that you are away, what do you see? You know, how do you negotiate? If you were to write something about the Orang Asli and you want to critically address these um, issues? It's a difficult question to answer. I mean, the, the problem that you have, which is less of a problem for me, I mean, uh, is that you will always be watched in, in a way of whatever you say that you consider to be um, you know, critical. I mean, I know this really well. I think uh, several years ago I was interviewed on, uh, on the radio. I won't mention the name of it. But in, they were concerned that they might lose their license if I were to say anything controversial. So in the one hour interview that I had with this uh, interviewer, I talked about every possible indigenous group in any part of the world that you can think of, but said very little about Malaysia. 
but the thing is that you can actually sometimes um, broach those kinds of critiques. So the topic that I was given uh, in this interview was the politics of indigeneity. So it is a really problematic concept here. And, uh, but the way I approached it, I criticized anthropologists because in my presentation I talked about indigeneity, but instead of uh, uh, approaching it in the way that I was critical of the government. I criticized anthropologists for not standing on the side of the uh, indigenous peoples in the study because they came up with abstract models and they came up with theses and theories. And after being an academic for you know, a good part of 40 years, uh, you know, I still do it. But sometimes I ask the question, why are you doing it? And in academia, probably not in Malaysia, but in Australia, it's all about how you can speak more unintelligibly to the other person. <laughs> so the more unintelligible you are, the more abstract, you know, you're considered to be a better academic. <laughs> so I've, I've had enough of that. <laughs> and so these days I try to speak plainly. And I think uh, when it comes to the politics of indigeneity and what you are doing, uh, I would you know, urge you to continue, you know, Doing what you're doing, and I, some, some of the, uh, perhaps one of the ways you can approach this is by, you know, instilling the knowledge that you have gradually. Uh, at, at one point, I didn't have that many friends because they didn't want to talk to me. Uh, but, uh, I would just continually, you know, tell them about the Orangasi. Uh, even now in the chat groups, I do that. And, uh, <laughs> Uh, so that some of the members of my chat groups are here, and they would know, you know, that I do it in a very, uh, not in a very confronting way, but, you know, in a more subtle way. And that takes a bit of, uh, a bit of conscious effort. But, you know, keep on what you're doing. Uh, you know, get, if you can persuade at least, you know, have a target. Maybe target is a wrong word. Target is a very uh, aggressive word. But you know, let's have a goal <laughs> of saying that each uh, week you're going to persuade five people to be on that side. And once you, you do that, you know, you multiply tremendously. So educating, perhaps, yes, uh, you have studied about you know, the impact of education sort of formal education on the Orangasli. Now it's time for you to educate the masses about the problems that the Orangasli are facing. You've been doing this for 30 years. Has the Jabatam Orangasli ever invited you to talk to them? But if not, why not? <laughs> <laughs> what, what do you think? Obviously not. I think you have a lot of friends who are scared of them. I do not know. I mean, I know that um, in 1997, when I, uh, you know, co-wrote a book with three other, you know, anthropologists, and evidently uh, we were all accused of being um, foreigners, and I was referred to as a misguided Malaysian, being uh, misguided by uh, three other Jewish. <laughs> and I received uh, a very harsh, uh, those were the days when we, uh, we did not use the email as much, but I received a very harsh letter from my co-author and uh, pointing out that I was the one who was suggesting because they wanted to be polite and diplomatic in the language that they used. But, uh, in my writing, I said, let's call it spade a spade. Mm -hmm. you know, so let's be more direct about things. And it, finally, we came up with a compromise. The book was critical of development, uh, but I would think not as, you know, uh, not as damaging as the object. So they, there's a lot of work to do, but I, I'm taking a difference. Uh, I would say a, a different approach now. Uh, rather than focusing on, you know, criticizing the 
the government or criticize well, let me say, I volunteer to get you in here, Jack Ross. Even now, if you are, if you are yeah. interested. So instead of criticizing the government or authorities or the educational system, I, I want to take a different approach because <coughs> what I feel that is really lacking is that we still do not res respect the Orangans in the way. So I'm using it in such a way that I want to focus on on um, on what lessons that we can get, you know, the wisdom of the Orangasi. And in you know, my talk I gave a bit and yeah, I mean I was a very different person until, you know, I lived with the Samaya and you know, it changed me quite um, quite substantially I would say. Like what you just said right at the end is I think part of the problem very often with many, shall we say, indigenous management groups, as in the like government agencies, is that we or they tend to focus on what we think they want or we want to tell them what we think they need rather than engaging them in a dialogue on what they really want to do and quite often I feel is they just want to be left alone and then we come up with this modern development model where no you can't be left alone because look at the statistics too much, too much malnutrition uh, poverty, disease, and all those things. So therefore, we have to come in and uproot your lifestyle. So how much philosophizing is there about like, what you've been talking about, basically? How much engagement has there been with, shall we say, the development authorities on where to go? I think, yeah, you know, what we have is is uh, a very deeply entrenched system of thinking here to the extent that we have to uh, you know put all our efforts in trying to change the thing so i work with a group of people uh, philosophers mostly uh, they're based quite a number of them in europe and uh, we call it epistemologies of the south because we have come to to a point where that we take it for granted that there's only one way of doing things so when it comes to development, for example, this is this is the way development should proceed. And the dominant Western way of thinking, even though you might consider yourself to be in Malaysia, but you have already had a colonial system, uh, a, system a long standing system of indoctrinating, indoctrinating you, I would use the word very strongly as indoctrinating you, into a particular way of thinking. Now, we, we don't really have the answers as yet, but I think it's really important to start rather than, than speaking about things. It is important for us now to start listening. And this is where, uh, in the Epistemologies of the South project, we are going out there, you know, trying to, to get different ways of thinking. Now, sometimes when we speak about thinking, the focus is on philosophy. And we think in terms of, okay, uh, you know, it's all through the kind of abstract way of the mental energy and effort that we put into coming up with certain kinds of models, paradigms, or theories. But what we fail to see is that in many uh, cultures, this is not the way, you know, not the way they approach the world. So uh, indigenous peoples in South America, uh, for them it's to do with the, when they say, uh, you know, well, I won't talk about this. I was going to talk about the South Americans, but let's take the Australian Aboriginal people. Uh, when the uh, park officials uh, went to the Aboriginal people and to talk to them about fire management, and the anthropologist that uh, studied a person called Henry Lewis. So when he was talking to the Aboriginal elder about uh, fire control, the elder took out a match and threw the match into the bush and told the anthropologist. The anthropologist started to get really uh, nervous about it because you know, he saw the fire gradually raging and spreading in, in, in one direction. And the uh, Aboriginal elder told the anthropologist that the fire is going to stop over there. Pointed at the point, and when the fire reached at that point, it stopped. So Henry Lewis was absolutely puzzled as how, and asked him, how, how did he know that the fire was going to stop there? And he said, 
it's a feeling. So how do you then, how do you make sense of this feeling? So what is this feeling? Let's look at it uh, in a more objective way and start to analyze it. So the, the indigenous Australian, for him the feeling was to do with the smell, was to do with the um, with the insects that were around, flying, he knew which way, where the, the dry vegetation was located, where it ended. He had the feel in terms of the um, you know, things that we, we, we may not be able to, to comprehend because this is, not, this is not the way we approach um, knowledge. Because for them, they understand that their knowledges are not just through this abstract mental extraction of the you know, material that we have. But these knowledges are formed, they are transmitted through ways that are different from ours. And so I think what we have had is that we have had a long-standing colon European colonial system that has literally wiped out, erased uh, a lot of this kind of knowledges that existed elsewhere in different parts of the world. Now it's the time for us to look at ways of how we can retrieve. You know, it's a way, not just retrieve, but re retrieval of that knowledge, of you know, these knowledges, I should say, or epistemologies, but also, more importantly, how we can revive and resuscitate them. So, it could be Chinese medicine, it could be, uh, you know, yoga, or it could be, you know, uh, Aikido, or it could be, you know, any, uh, you know, Aboriginal sort of, uh, practices which in the past have been considered and still is as traditional that doesn't have any room or space in our modern living. So it's about time that we, we change that mindset. It's very really important that we think that the traditional has been sometimes uh, prematurely discarded into the dustbin of history. It's time for us to retrieve it and you know, re revive it. So it could be our traditions, it could be you know, indigenous people's traditions. I think this, I would say, uh, the lie that we've been told, the myth that tradition had no space in the modern world is in fact you know, a myth that we have to dispel. We have dispelled it now, but now it's the action. You know, we have to try to you know, take it out of the dustbin of history and uh, go through it and look at ways of how we can you know, incorporate it incorporate it into our own lives today. Big challenge. <laughs> but let's do it slowly. We we want to say thank you uh, to uh, Professor Dr. Gomez for not just being here but I think uh, teaching us to listen with our hearts. More importantly I think teaching us uh, to understand what we don't understand actually which is so much, um, and there's so much more to do, and as you put it, right, so it's a big challenge. Um, but you've opened up a new way of understanding for many of us here in our various uh, stations of life. And we want to say uh, thank you uh, on behalf of uh, GCSM and also uh, all of us here. So please.